Well, good evening, everyone. So um, those of you who were at this event last year might remember that I made my debut as a singer at this event last year. <laughs> I've, I've got some really good news for you this year, and for me as well. I, I haven't been asked to repeat the performance. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk to you um, just about the impact of some of um, UNSW work. So I, I guess everyone here would be aware of the dramatic cost reductions that have occurred in photovoltaics over the last five years in particular. But um, I'm just trying to establish it in a wider audience's mind that here at UNSW, we were largely responsible for that uh, improvement. So I'll just go over the, you know, some of the key um, issues that have been involved in, in uh, the impact that UNSW's made. So you know, one of the impacts we made had been with the technology so this is just a chart I, I like to show, just plotting the improvements in silicon laboratory efficiency over the last few decades. But um, if you look up the top there, all those red dots are UNSW ones. So for 33, 30 of the last 33 years, we actually held the record for silicon cell efficiency and improved the performance by 50% relative. So that's quite a contribution in terms of technology. In fact, in this um, handbook of energy, I was really pleased to see that it's actually been selected as one of the top 10 milestones in photovoltaics. So number one was Becquerel discovering the photovoltaic effect. Number five was the very early results here at Bell Labs, and then we came in as number eight. Um, so that, that's been uh, quite a significant impact. And then the recent uptake of the PERC technology that was the ultimate cell design that was developed in that 30-year evolutionary period, that's now becoming the commercial standard, as I think we're aware. So that's um, been really good progress on the, on the technical front. I think, as Darren said, the other contribution we've made, and possibly even more important, is in terms of the people that we've trained. So in the early days, it was through research. And this is just a photo when we got our first 20% efficient cell with some of the early doctoral students within the group that have gone on to do wonderful things. So um, yeah, I think you'll recognise many of the people there, but they've all gone on to have a wonderful career in the industry. So things were taken to a new level when uh, Stuart started the teaching program here. So 2000 was the first year the courses operated, and um, it was the world's first Bachelor of Photovoltaic Engineering and it's still the only one that I'm aware of anyhow. I think Richard knows of one more, but um, still the only one that really uh, counts. So presently we've got... <laughs> we've presently got 526 students enrolled last time I was shown some figures, including 108 PhD students. So that's just a massive resource, and, and we completely uh, swamp any other university activity worldwide, I think, in this space. So, you know, like it's hard to find other groups that would have 20 PhD students that would be a large group anywhere else internationally. And, th and that's a massive resource, so I'm just starting to realise what a huge resource having that number of um, students and PhD students in particular that are dedicated to doing something significant in the space. So a massive resource for us, and, and as Darren said, I think We've reached the stage where we can take on some really significant challenges with the resources we have available. Um, our most famous um, students, of course, Zheng Rong. Um, but um, I credit him with, um, I guess, with, with starting the changes that resulted in the recent uh, price reductions in photovoltaics. So up there is a graph. Um, I think Jeremy used it in his talk as well. But, that just shows in the orange the cost, redu sorry, the, the, uh, cost reduction, here I was right the first time, cost reduction in photovoltaics over the last 40 years. Happens to coincide with the period I've been working in the space. And then the blue shows the uptake of the technology. So it all started happening, and I think Jeremy said this at least in one version of his talks, it all started happening around 2005. And that just happens to be the time when Zheng Rong started getting up, rank, ramping up his manufacturing in China. So if you look at the transition from you know, being a technology of the future to being a technology of the here and now, it all occurred over that 2005 to 2010 period, the big transition. And if you look at the manufacturing 
figure in the, in the bottom there, you'll see that coincided with the transfer of the manufacturing from China. So previously it was dominated by Japan with the US and Germany playing a secondary role, but then uh, over that period the, the manufacturing shifted to China where the manufacturing cost was very low. And this is, um, this is the start of it all. This is the first manufacturing facility in China. Like looking at China now and what it's doing in photovoltaics, it's easy to imagine that it was easy to get manufacturing established there. But it was a country completely without any infrastructure for photovoltaic manufacturing. I remember in the early days, Zheng Rong used to import his glass from Sydney because there was no low iron glass produced in China, whereas now China uh, produces um, more low iron glass than any other country internationally. But, but uh, in the era that uh, Zheng Rong set this up, there just wasn't any infrastructure that, there. So very heavily depended on other expertise in the group to get the line going, particularly Ted Spitalak in terms of getting equipment into China and commissioned and so on, and then Stuart in getting the engineers trained and the pr production processes going and so on. And this is what kick-started the manufacturing revolution in China. So Zheng Rong was about two years ahead in terms of manufacturing in China of the, um, of the next group that, that followed. The other thing that Zheng Rong did was he, he pioneered the approach of building up the manufacturing activity in China through financing from US investors. So he was the first private company to list on the New York Stock Exchange. And if you look at all the large manufacturers in China, they followed Zheng Rong through this same path to, to build up their capacity within China. And that build up of capacity was what uh, has led to the cost reduction. So the, the Zheng Rong um, wasn't the sole founder of um, SunTech. There's a group of six that are recognized as the founders and five of them were Australians. Um, but all but Zheng Rong, after setting up SunTech, went on to set up the next company, CSUN or Sunergy. Um, so, you know, within a couple of years of SunTech starting, Sunergy was up manufacturing with the same sort of founders. And each time a new company, this, this group just bounced around China setting up new facilities. And each time they'd grab some technical people from the group here to provide the, the processing expertise need to establish. So that little uh, pie diagram down the bottom, someone from Harvard did a survey of the um, composition of the, of the key personnel, key management personnel within the Chinese manufacturers. And the little um, orange segment there is Australia. So we've got many, uh, nearly as many um, people educated in Australia that are populating the key positions in the Chinese industry as, for, as they were educated in China, far ahead of any other um, Western country. So we, it, it's with some um, strong evidence that we can claim that um, UNSW played a big role in establishing the industry, which then led to these cost reduction. I've tried to imagine what the PV industry might look like if Zheng Rong hadn't gone to China. So um, his timing was really very good. He, he listed on the US exchange at a time where there's a huge appetite for Chinese stocks. But a couple of years after his listing, we had the global financial crisis. And after then, there was very little interest in Chinese stocks anymore. So there was a window of opportunity and um, Zheng Rong got through it magnificently. But without Zheng Rong actually having the initiative to, to do that, um, you know, it, it's doubtful that Chinese would now, China would now be the leading manufacturer, or if so, it's doubtful that the costs of the cells would be where they are now. So the shift of the industry to um, China, you know, one consequence of that has been reduction of costs. So we've seen this. So in June 2008, the average selling price of PV modules was $4.18 US a watt. This is like the wholesale volume price. But uh, last month, it dropped below 40 cents per watt. So, so really, there has been a factor of 10 reduction in photovoltaic costs over, over an eight-year period, which is really quite dramatic. And again, we can trace that back to Zhang Rong's initiative and then to UNSW through the training and support that he received from here. At the system level, we're seeing some really big impacts, you know, particularly over the last year. So this just shows systems going in different places of the world, what the, these are the power purchase agreements, whereby a company agrees to supply the power developed by the um, uh, PV system to a, to a buyer. 
at a, at a guaranteed rate over a guaranteed period, generally 20 years. But these are just some of the prices that have been agreed over the last couple of years. And the um, orange line at the top shows the PV prices. So they're reducing from about 120 US dollars a megawatt hour. And to most recently, in particular over the last year, the prices have really dropped quite dramatically. And the most recent bid was 24 US dollars a megawatt hour, which is lower in cost than possible that, than you could have bid with any other electricity generation technology. So the um, recent bid in Chile had a, um, a very broad range of technologies bidding. And the PV came in at $29 a megawatt hour. And the, and the coal, which has long been regarded as the cheapest way of making electricity, came in at $57 a megawatt hour, nearly double. So really, um, some big changes occurring in the industry and rapidly increasing recognition. So not, not everyone's aware of this sudden transition and reduction in costs. The blue line shows the corresponding uh, bid prices for wind energy, which has long been the cheapest form of, um, of the new renewables, but um, photovoltaics is starting to undercut it. So something that's happened quite recently and probably not widely appreciated. But as a result of this, like Bloomberg has been one company that has quickly, has been quick to recognise the changes that have been occurring within photovoltaics and the reduction in manu manufacturing costs. And this is one of the more optimistic forecasts for future photovoltaic installations up to 2040. So that's the yellow areas there are photovoltaics, so dominating the new installation capacity you know, over the coming decades. But if you look at the volume that um, Bloomberg have projected for 2040, it's 200 megawatts. So roughly three times the, the amount of photovoltaics that are going to be produced this year. So you, like just that alone suggests to me it's really a very conservative estimate, despite the fact that it's one of the um, most optimistic that's been made to date. So I think we're going to see a future where photovoltaic nearly completely dominates the new electricity generation capacity. And some of those grey and black areas down the bottom, the, the gas and the coal, are going to have great difficulty reaching the capacities indicated there. I was just at a presentation uh, on Tuesday, I guess it was, by Bloomberg. But they, that's where I came across this graph here, where they've analysed the uh, Australian industry. And this is a microism of, of what's happening internationally, so it's quite interesting. But this was a chart they produced earlier this year just showing the costs of different technologies and how they might evolve. But um, you know, the yellow again is photovoltaics and the blue is wind. The black bar at the, co at the top is the cost of a new coal-fired power plant. So um, Bloomberg um, reckoned that we were just at the stage now where you could install photovoltaics in Australia cheaper than a new coal-fired plant. Photovoltaics was expected to reduce quite quickly and then uh, undercut wind and, and coal further, as indicated there. But if you look at the lines at the bottom, they're the really important ones, I think, for um, what happens here in Australia. But the dotted line shows the cost of electricity generation from a coal plant if you um, refurbish it to extend its life, which is a cheap way of, of um, of getting extra electricity generated. So that's about 40, these are Australian dollars in this case, 40 Australian dollars per megawatt hour. And then the grey area down the bottom shows the marginal cost. So this is the incremental cost of producing each unit of electricity from a coal-fired power plant. And that's the um, marginal cost of, of existing black coal plants, so not counting the uh, capital cost of the plant. If we look at um, that recent uh, bid, that 24 US, works out at $32 or something uh, Australian, 32 Australian dollars per megawatt hour. It's right in that range of short term, short run marginal cost of black coal. So we're getting to a really interesting stage in terms of being able to turn our coal plants off because it's going to be cheaper to install solar plants. The, uh, the star above it at the $100 point is um, what arena thinks now it recently encouraged some installation of some large systems in Australia and this was its take on what the, um, the cost of installing a system right now in Australia, the, the, the cost of the electricity produced from a PV system installed right now, but um, uh, you know, very much higher than the Abu Dhabi type of cost. So you, you know, there's real good reason for expecting the, um, the price of 
associated with PV in Australia to drop very rapidly as we get up to the same type of costs that um, we're seeing in other parts of the world. It's really important to, um, to get down to these costs by 2030, as I'll show in the next slide. So, um, you know, in the previous slide, um, you might have noticed that the solar cost stayed above the costs of refurbishing coal power plant, and uh, Bloomberg therefore were able to conclude that what Australia will do is, is this. We'll, um, our, as our coal fleet retires, we'll spend money on refurbishing them because it's going to be cheaper than the solar option. But if we can get down to the, that incremental cost of coal or the refurbishing cost with refurbished plant, um, this is not going to happen. So for, for Australia to um, cut back its CO2 emissions, I think it's really important that we get rid of our coal plants as quickly as we can. So we need to bring down the photovoltaics cost really quickly to, um, to prevent this type of um, occurrence shown here, extension of the light of life of our existing plant. If we look at the world um, globally, you know, I think the problem is even more serious. So that this is um, annual CO2 emissions, gigatons per year. And the, the black line at the top shows you know, what's been happening. So we've been going up very rapidly. But the, um, the extension of that line shows what we need to do if we're going to restrict global temperature rises to two, two degrees. And you can see um, here from the bottom, you know, this is what is likely to happen in several of the big emitters. So um, you can see a problem looming over the next uh, 10, 15 years in that if we only count the four biggest emitters, we're going to already bump into this line of, um, that we need to meet to, to, to keep, get CO2 emissions under control. Um, so even the four big emitters, without allowing the rest of the world, including Australia, we, we bump into the allowable budget for CO2 emissions. And uh, the really disturbing thing is there's big plants, big plans for many more coal plants to go in different parts of the world. The blue regions there are the countries that have the plans for the largest installation. But we have about 1,900 gigawatts of coal-fired plants worldwide now, which are producing most of our CO2 emissions. There's another 1,300 gigawatts in the planning stages, approved, planned, or whatever, that were very well documented plants. And this is where they're all going. Um, these, these are some of the countries involved, some of the, so many in the Asian region. So Bloomberg showed this slide here. So outside of Asia, it's expected that this is showing coal, expected coal cons consumption um, outside Australia, outside Asia on, um, on your left, and then in Asia on the right. So even though worldwide we're expecting to see a slight falling off in the use of coal, that's going to be more than compensated by the, um, by the increased uptake in Australia. So I think this is where our centre can make a, make, make a difference and we're possibly one of the best placed groups worldwide you know, to really make a difference here. If we can accelerate the cost reductions that we're seeing in photovoltaics and, and estimates like those Bloomberg ones have to by their nature be conservative, but if we can push an even more aggressive agenda, we could avert a lot of this from happening. So I think we as a group have a real opportunity to impact um, future CO2 emissions, so a major role in the global economy. So one thing that's really important, and, and Stuart will no, no doubt talk a little bit about this, so we've got to perfect the perk. We've got to perfect its production and get it up to the types of efficiencies that we demonstrate in the laboratory. So that's one of the more important things that we're doing now. And the other thing I think really important, if we can develop a pipeline of technology with further cost reduction potential, and this is where I think tandem cells come in. And Darren mentioned um, the work that uh, Zhao Jing and uh, Nita have been doing in improving efficiencies. But part of the reason that we're interested in these other materials is that they're suitable for stacking on top of silicon as tandem structures. So we need to push on with that. But as Darren said, our, our most valuable resource is our past students. So we look forward to your future contributions and to making, allowing the PV group to continue to make impact at, at the global scale. Thanks very much. Thank you.